Um, thank you very much for that warm welcome. Um, thank you for inviting me here. I am delighted to spend a whole week <laughs> in Jerusalem with my husband. Uh, we never spend a whole week together, ever. Um, so this is really delightful for me. And I'm especially delighted that uh, we are spending two days together talking about social-emotional learning. And I understand that that has been a, a topic uh, of focus for almost a year and that there was a conference a year ago focused on the same topic, which is very exciting because um, this is an area that has been around for decades but has only recently really garnered the attention that it demands. And I'm really excited to be talking about it. So I, uh, I have 45 minutes to tell you everything I know about social emotional learning. And so um, I'm going to talk quickly and give you an overview of the work that we do in my lab. And I'm going to try and make the case for innovation in this field. I'm actually going to try and make the case that uh, the field of social emotional learning has made huge progress but needs to change to be uh, viable and sustainable into the future. And some of my colleagues in the field don't like it when I say that. But I think it's really important, as we heard in the very beginning, for um, fields such as this, academic disciplines for educational practice to be reflective and self-critical and to grow over time. And so I'm going to make that case for you today. So I'm going to, in 45 minutes, talk about four main things. I'm going to very briefly share with you some of the uh, background of our lab, the lab that I have at Harvard. And then I'm going to tell you in just a couple minutes about 20 years of science in social emotional learning. So we'll do that very quickly. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we know is most effective from practice. And then the bulk of my time I hope to spend in this area, which is to say to really think carefully about what have we learned and how can that make our work more effective. And I think that there are new ways to think about the practical work. So I'm going to talk about implementation and new approaches to practice. I'm going to talk about how we talk about the field, so the language that we use. And this will be very brief because I have a session later today where uh, we'll go deeper in that area. And then I'll share with you a little bit of our experience contextualizing SEL from our work in the US to other places. OK, so um, in the ESL lab, which stands for Ecological Approaches to Social and Emotional Learning. We call it easel because we don't want to say all those words every time. The words are important because much of the work in social emotional learning until now has been very focused on individual children and youth and their skills. And our view, our view is that the science tells us that we have to step back and look closely and carefully at settings ecologies in addition to individuals. And so our lab is organized around that premise. We do three main things. We do research and evaluation. So we, I'm a developmental psychologist by training. I do big longitudinal studies following young people, their parents, their educators from early childhood through adolescence, tracking the relationship between experiences and social, emotional, and behavioral outcomes. So we do lots of research. We do big randomized control trials of interventions, of programs designed for early childhood and elementary school settings. And then we build on that scientific enterprise to design new strategies. So we have a big focus in our lab on creating practical tools that can be used in early childhood settings, in schools, in out of school time settings that respond to the evidence. And then finally, we do a lot of work communicating with the field. So we write briefing reports. We create tools to help those uh, who are trying to learn about social emotional learning 
get access to the most sound evidence, to make judgments about what's important to them, to think about their priorities. So we create tools for the field. And I'm gonna share with you a little bit of each of these things. Before I go on, I'll just say again, and this I think echoes the comments from the very beginning, which is that our lab is grounded in a discipline called prevention science. And prevention science is a field that had its origins uh, in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, in uh, clinical practice focused on clinical disorder, so mitigating and moderating clinical disorder. And the approach of prevention science is really about connecting what we know, the evidence, very closely to what we do, the practice, and then using what we do to filter back in and grow the knowledge base. And prevention science has been uh, has grown, it's, the discipline has grown over the last 20 years. It has spread into other areas and is well rooted in educational science today. And so we adopt this same approach, which is that we are always thinking about this cycle. How do we connect <coughs> what we know to how we think about what we do? And then can we look closely at what we do through measurement and evaluation to then build the knowledge base and that this cycle is always happening so that the field is living. It is always changing and growing because we are always building on what we know. Okay, so you'll see work from each of these areas as I go forward. Okay, so the science, uh, I always start by talking a little bit about what we mean by social and emotional learning uh, for those of you who have spent some time in this field, you know that uh, there's a lot of discussion about what we mean by social and emotional learning, what we mean by social and emotional skills and competencies, attitudes, habits, ways of thinking. And I spend a lot of time in meetings. Uh, everybody has to go to a lot of meetings. <laughs> and every single meeting, about social and emotional learning that I go to begins with the question, what are we talking about? And we still, after 20 years, are asking ourselves this question. And so I'm gonna give you my view of what we're talking about <laughs> for social emotional learning. So I start always with the classroom. This is a classroom with some small children in it, but you could imagine any educational setting with which you are familiar. So it could be an out of school time setting, a youth development setting, it could be uh, a classroom for 10 year olds or 14 year olds, just put your head into that, that setting and imagine an academic task. For four and five year olds, this reading with an adult in the classroom is an academic task. They are learning about words, they are learning about narrative, they are learning about some kind of content that is in the book that the teacher in this picture is reading. And just imagine, what does it take for that group of children to engage in that academic task? They have to organize and focus their thinking. They have to look at the page, the pictures on the page. They have to hear the words, and they have to look at the teacher. They have to respond to something that might be coming from another child who is sitting with them. So they have to organize and marshal how they think. They have to manage their behavior. If you imagine children this age sitting that close together, there's lots of this. And they have to manage that. They have to control that so that they can hear what the teacher is saying. They need to have relationships with those around them in order to trust them, to hear what they are saying, and have a relationship with that adult who is communicating something very important. And then finally, always, in every moment, we are emotional beings, so they have to understand and manage the feelings that they're having in that moment. These key features of the social and emotional world are not characteristic of just those children in that classroom. That adult, that teacher, the educator, has to do all four of those things as well. So those social and emotional phenomena are really about that system in the classroom. And that's how we think about social and emotional learning. Of course, the world responds and the world is involved in social emotional learning. And if you 
do what I do, which is get on Google in the middle of the night when you can't sleep and type in social and emotional learning, everything in the world shows up on the screen. It's not just social and emotional skills and competencies, it's everything. It's things like traits, it's emotional intelligence, it's social intelligence, it's all these different things. And they're all described in different ways. And that in itself is actually quite a good thing. It's a good thing to have many disciplines and perspectives and ways of thinking contributing to the dialogue about social emotional learning. The challenge is that it gets very difficult to be precise and specific and focused in the work. We just spend time having arguments about what's important. And so uh, in our lab, we have tried over many years to distill different literatures into a kind of coherent and specific view of what kinds of skills and competencies are included. And I'm going to share this with you now and uh, know that there are lots of different perspectives on how this work is organized. So based on the literature, we organize social and emotional skills into basically six complicated categories. So six categories, three that I would describe as skills and competencies, and they're in the cognitive, the emotion, and the social domains. When you talk, when one talks about social and emotional learning, what comes to mind are social and emotional skills. The literature tells us that there are foundational cognitive skills that are important as well. And they're often forgotten when we talk about social emotional learning. So usually I walk over and then people can't hear me. So I'll stay here, but I have little self-control, which is why I study this stuff. So I'll, I have to, okay. <laughs> In the cognitive domain, we have those core executive functions that are managed and modulated by the prefrontal cortex. This, the neuroscience of behavior, uh, has given us a huge amount of information about this domain. And this is managing and shifting attention, controlling impulses, planning, goal setting, critical thinking. In the emotion domain, you have things that you would imagine. Emotion expression, emotion regulation, empathy. So understanding, navigating, modulating the emotional world. In the social domain, we have things like understanding social cues, reading the social environment, when there are no words involved. So being able to understand those subtle cues that come from others. Pro-social behavior, conflict resolution, and so on. On this side, on the other side, we have a whole other set of key things. <laughs> I say things because we have disagreements about what these actually are. And we call this the sort of belief ecology, which is attitudes, ways of thinking, habits of mind, that really sit in between uh, having a skill or a competency and using it when it matters to use it. So these are ways of thinking that work with skills and competencies to actually drive action in the world. And uh, we put these into three big categories, beliefs and knowledge of self and identity, character and values, so this is sort of civic, moral, ethical values, and then a category called personality. And I put this in here because there is a vast literature on personality characteristics, whether we like it or not, or agree with it or not, but it is invoked in the world of social emotional learning. In fact, OECD uh, has organized a framework for social and emotional learning that is largely based on personality literature. And so we have, to, we have to incorporate this domain because it's embedded in the literature and represents the kind of boundaries of how we think about this field. So in our lab, when we do our work, we do our practical work, we do our communications work, we're always navigating between these six categories. The uh, National Commission, so Rami mentioned this commission uh, that was uh, running in the US for two years it finished its work one year ago this month, maybe today actually was the day. Um, and it was a, a, a robust commission of scientists, practitioners, policymakers, all working together in different working groups to propel this field forward. And the commission came to a consensus 
it was a miracle, uh, the commission came to a consensus about what was included in this big domain and, and developed this graphic. It's very consistent, I would say. I was on the commission. It was very consistent with my view of what's included. Um, but I think it's a nice uh, configuration to show the dynamic interplay between skills and competencies, which you see in the center. So we have rigorous academic content and learning experiences, so we never forget uh, important academic work surrounded by those key cognitive, emotional, and social competencies. And then in the ring, the next ring, we have character and values on one side and attitudes, beliefs, and mindsets on the other. And then right here on the outside, we have the context. Everything is situated in a learning context or a learning environment and a set of key relationships. I think this is a very good model to work within. OK, last thing. I'll say about this is I'm a developmentalist. I worry about human development. And I worry that we in our field, sometimes in the field of social emotional learning, get imprecise with regard to human development and what we know about human development. So when you look at the materials aligned with social and emotional learning, when you look at programs and practices, they really aren't developmental. So not everything I've just described to you is important all the time. Things uh, uh, progress developmentally. Some things are very important at certain stages and then set up the next stage of development. And so in our group, just focusing for now on the cognitive, emotion, and social domains, those that were in the middle of that graphic, we think a lot about uh, the kind of developmental progression and how we might be very precise and focused in our practical work by thinking developmentally. And so this is a configuration that we put together in this sort of first phase, which is really the first years of schooling, ages roughly three to six. The literature tells us that these kinds of skills and competencies emerge and expand rapidly, particularly those core executive functions, the prefrontal cortex, uh, expands tremendously during this period. And that's when those core executive functions, focusing attention, working memory, impulse control, if you think of any two or three-year-old you know, you know that impulse control is something that is happening. That's what's growing during this developmental period. We have also basic emotion skills, basic emo emotion and behavior management, and then sort of foundational social engagement. The reason I spend so much time on this is because if we were to identify a set of practices and try and build complex social problem solving for four and five-year-olds, we would be working in the wrong area. And that's what many practices in social emotional learning tend to do, is that they seem like they, they target lots of skills that are too complex for the age group. So my point is, think developmentally and focus on specific areas depending on this, the age and stage of the child involved or children involved. This set of skills set up the next set, more complex versions of each of these. Uh, we have in phase sort of stage two, ages six to nine-ish, which is when children begin to take over uh, management of their own lives. They begin to organize their own backpack, for example. This is a big phase in my household. When do you have to take care of your own backpack that goes to you with school, goes with you to school? Will you remember all the things that go in it? To take them out at the end of the day, to put them in at the beginning of the day. That's planning and organizing and setting goals. We have more complex perspective taking and empathy and understanding social cues. The point here is that it's very, very hard to have and hold empathy for another without a basic emotional repertoire. That's something that has to be built first. It's very hard to read the social environment, to read the cues that others are sharing without experience in the social world. It's very hard to leap into the head or the shoes of another without some mental or cognitive flexibility. So these stages build on each other. And then as we head toward uh, ages nine or 10, we can expect more uh, complex pro-social negotiation, navigation, cooperation, and that really draws on all of these prior skills. 
So that we have to think developmentally. Okay, uh, what's the evidence? We have four big bodies of evidence, and I know that when Kim Schonert Reichel was here last year, she gave you a good overview of this, and I'm going to go very quickly through it. The first is that we have uh, a handful of long term correlational studies, and these studies basically tell us that these foundational social and emotional skills over here, these kinds of things, captured when children are ages four, five, and six, predict life outcomes 20 to 30 years later. And they do that even after controlling sociodemographic factors and experiences and after controlling all those academic things that sit in the middle, which is just, it's not a randomized trial, but it's a powerful body of evidence because it's really about early to life outcomes, the kinds of things that as societies we care deeply about 20 to 30 years later. We have many, many, many studies of interventions. So uh, we have lots of studies where someone has adopted a program, randomized schools or classrooms to either have the program or not, and then followed children, uh, adults over lots of time. I've done many of those studies myself. And across those studies, generally we know that when we intervene and directly manipulate this body of skills and change them, we see outcomes that we care about. And we know this from these kinds of programs. I'm going to come back to this. These are the kinds of programs for schools that are adopted and tested. They're, we call them comprehensive SEL programs. This is the famous meta-analysis from 2011 that basically said across 213 studies, we know that we can uh, acquire the outcomes in the social and emotional domain that we expect. There have been additional meta-analyses to confirm those findings and build upon them. So we have a pretty robust signal that if we intervene in this area, we can expect to see change. This is just an example of a, from a study that I did of, the, of one of those programs called the 4Rs, and it makes a slightly more subtle point. In this study, we implemented a program. We followed third graders for third graders who are eight and nine years old, uh, over three years. And we found that in general, the program we were testing had positive impacts for everybody in the population. We also found that for those children who were rated by their teachers as being the most uh, difficult behaviorally at the start of the study, those children did the best academically as a result of the intervention. So those are the children, a very small number in the population, who are suspended from their classrooms, who are expelled from school, who are disengaged from the learning environment. In this case, those children were re-engaged because of this program in the academic learning environment and showed very robust effects on academic outcomes using state standardized tests. This kind of finding, which is not that unusual in this field, makes a very strong case for the role of social and emotional learning in conversations about equity. Right? So these are children who are removed from the environment. They are lost from the academic opportunities that they need. But social and emotional learning transforms that for them. OK, we also see effects at the classroom level of all of these kinds of interventions, uh, doing observations of classroom practice, teacher practice. These are very robust findings. They're probably the most robust set of findings in this field and are repeated across many, many studies. So the story is that implementing social and emotional learning programs that are often oriented toward individual skill development have effects at the level of teacher practice and in classrooms which is an important finding, and repeated over and over and over again. So just a summary of this. This is 20 years of science. This is the summary that I put together. I think that there is a very strong signal from the evidence. But the truth is, it is not consistent. It's mixed. So when we put lots of studies together, 
we sometimes see these broad-based effects, as we did with those meta-analyses, but sometimes when we do really large-scale studies, demonstration projects with many different programs, we don't see any effects at all. And there's a big conversation in the US about why that is the case. My understanding, my view, is that in those large-scale studies, we've disconnected the intervention from a close and carefully aligned measurement battery. And that keeps us from observing the effects that are there. So that's the story from what we, I call sort of the lumping studies together. Uh, when we do very close studies of one program with carefully aligned measurement, we tend to see effects. What this tells me is that when we're adopting one approach or another in practice, and we want to uh, monitor what's happening over time, we need to think very, very carefully about the kinds of tools that we use to capture growth and change over time. Otherwise, we won't see anything, and, and we might miss important effects that are there. So uh, across all these studies, as many of you in the room, I'm sure, are aware, implementation varies tremendously, and we don't have a lot of information about what inside large comprehensive programs accounts for the effects that we see on outcomes. This is a big gap in our knowledge base. So finally, we have these meta-analyses, we have cost-benefit analyses, all uh, telling us that doing this work is positive. And then finally, we have a new science of stress, the brain and behavior that comes out of uh, neuroscience that tells us that stress has a profound impact on how the prefrontal cortex operates and that that cascades into negative behavior and that this dynamic can be addressed with strategies and practices that are from the world of social and emotional learning. That's a really, that's a much newer body of evidence but profoundly important because it says directly that if we intervene using social and emotional strategies and practices, we can interrupt a kind of trauma, toxic stress, uh, behavior cascade. Okay, so the practice. This is a, a guide we developed that synthesizes all of the information from 25 evidence-based SEL programs in the US. It's 400 pages. I sometimes carry it around with me for exercise. Um, but it's free and you don't have to carry it around. You can just get it online and look at it online. It really is a, it's a summary of the of what we know from social and emotional learning, and it's kind of a deep look at SEL practice. So after doing that work, we distilled a few lessons. The most effective work in SEL operates on two planes. One is teaching, big surprise. Teaching social and emotional skills and competencies directly. Uh, the teaching that is most effective includes four things. Adults modeling the behavior, living what they hope to see in the children they are teaching, teaching things directly, providing opportunities for young people to practice, to fail, to try again, and then having a language of SEL in the environment. All of this in the context of uh, activities that are engaging and where students have choice and agency over what they do. The second plane is a safe, caring learning environment. You can have the most effective, high quality instructional work. It will not be effective in an unsafe environment. It will only go so far. And so these two things work in dynamic interaction. I have many thoughts about the way to build these kinds of things. And some of those thoughts are not conventional, so we'll get to that in a moment. Um, these are just examples uh, of, of the high quality instructional work. In our lab, we create tools and routines and strategies that are fundamentally about transforming the environment that enable adults and children to do these things. And uh, I'll happily share all of these slides with you and you can look at these in more detail later. So what we've learned is that uh, effective practice really demands these six things. One is the clear, explicit instruction that I just described, which is that red circle. The other is being very clear about what is being taught. I always tell, talk about my son, Henry, who is 13 now, but 
is a very uh, interesting case of social and emotional development over time. And I feel bad because someday he's going to see me online and hear me talking about him, and it's terrible. But uh, when he was little, I would say as a parent, please, Henry, pay attention. We have to go. Pay attention. Put your coat on. Pay attention. He's going like this, looking around. And I realized that he didn't know what I meant by attention, the word attention. He had not learned it. And I had not taught him what I expected him to do when I was using that word. And so this being very explicit about what we mean, in social, the social and emotional world, these kinds of complex words come up all the time. A word like respect is foundational to social and emotional interactions and relationships, but it's, it's very hard to understand. It's a sort of complex idea, and we don't teach it. So being explicit is uh, critical. Defining expectations, so having goals and priorities, uh, building a positive culture and climate, thinking about how to integrate the work into the every day of every school and the entire setting. Of course, uh, focusing on adult well-being and adult competencies, and then thinking about how to extend the work to the broader context. And I almost kind of order these in a hierarchy, which is that we, we need to be very clear about what we mean and then extend outward into the environment. So to be really uh, robust and vibrant as a field and to sustain the work, I think we need three things to propel the field forward integration into the structures and practices of schools and schooling. I don't think that it's effective to have a set-aside, standalone program. We've done that for 30 years almost, and it has shown us where we can go, but it is not the end point. So I think we need to think as a field more directly about how to integrate the work into, wow, I'm running out of time, um, integrate the work into the, the, the sort of fabric OK, I'll make it. The fabric of schools and schooling, focusing on adults, and then thinking about how to maintain quality and sustainability practices on the ground. I'm going to talk about each of these. So now on to innovations. Yes. OK. 15 minutes. Um, right? <laughs> OK. I can do it. Uh, so now thinking about innovation. What does practice in SEL look like today? It looks like this. It looks like comprehensive programs that have many features to them. They have training and professional support. They have a scope and sequence and a curriculum. And sometimes they have assessment and tools that go along with it. This is what we've studied, this kind of thing. And they have been deemed to be largely effective. But we hear over and over again that they are not implemented in the manner in which they were tested. So when they go into the world, they don't get implemented in a way that would tell you I should expect those outcomes because it's being implemented the way I tested it. This is the most fundamental challenge for our field. So I ask the question, how can we improve these interventions? What should we do? Let's come up with something slightly different. And I think about interventions in this domain on these two dimensions. One is resources up and down. The other is flexibility, how adaptable it is going across. And I put existing interventions in the high resource. It takes lots of time, it takes money, and it takes support and training. And low flexibility, meaning we don't know how to adapt them so they suit lots of different settings. And my work is about that corner. Highly flexible, easy to do, and adaptable. And this is where we're doing our intervention development work. So what I'm thinking is, how do we identify strategies and practices that are common to effective curricula and design them as individual things that anybody can adopt and do? I get very excited about this idea. <laughs> they would be designed to be highly doable, to be adaptable and integratable into the fabric and structures of school and would be based on evidence, meaning they would have to follow a sequence, but then beyond that be uh, adaptable depending on the setting. My hypothesis is that with that, and with handing choice and agency over to educators, 
we would see greater take up and more implementation and perhaps stronger effects. So uh, I'll, I won't talk about this. I'm just going to skip over it. But you can look at it uh, later. This is really a prototype. We designed a set of interventions focused on one set of skills, self-regulation and executive function. And we did a bunch of tests on them. And you can read this. We did lots of piloting, adapting, revising, and then a test. And lo and behold, we saw large effects in the areas specifically targeted by these games. Those were in areas of executive function, attention, impulsivity, regulation-related skills as reported by teachers, and then an extension to general pro-social behavior. So we had an idea that if we designed something that was simple and doable, it might have high impact. So we developed a whole body of work focused on something that we call kernels of SEL, strategies and practices focused on social-emotional learning. And we asked the question in the beginning, how do we identify these kernels? Where would they be? <laughs> it's not, uh, it seemed easy in the beginning, but it was not easy. Um, we thought, OK, the best practice is in evidence-based programs. But what we need to do is turn those programs into data and then identify common strategies and practices across them. So we coded 25 programs. We identified common elements or strategies. We made decisions about what to design. We designed them. We piloted them. We redesigned them many times. And now we're next week uh, beginning a test of them in British Columbia. So we started by coding programs. This is a table from that guide that I just talked about that is 400 pages. These are the data we use to identify common strategies. And I'd be happy to talk about more, that more later. One example just of common strategies, these are programs, these are strategies. In every single of the 25 SEL programs that we coded, every single program has a routine for physiological regulation. Every single one. They all look quite different from each other. So the, the, the way they are operationalized is different. But they all have the same steps. They are the same. I think that that one strategy embedded in those complex programs might be an active ingredient that accounts for its impact. So I think there's real value in identifying these strategies. It'll build our knowledge base. So, so far, this is what we've done. This is what they look like. They look like this. Yay! <laughs> it feels so little for so much time. Um, but each one is one card. Each strategy is one, one thing. It's this. And each strategy has three parts. Making it explicit. What is the skill? What does it look like? Why are we doing it? So that's one part. The second part is something that you do, a strategy, a practice, something that happens that adults and children do together. And then the third part is on the back of the card. It's at the top. Debrief. What happened? What was it like to share your feelings with everyone? Do we think animals have feelings? Can you tell me why? Each kernel has this structure, and then each has a game or a, a thing that teachers and kids do together. My feeling, my hypothesis, is that handing these cards over and giving educators agency and choice in what they do based on what they are seeing in the students in their classroom will start them doing it more. And in each of these cards, teachers are expected to do the work with children. So we have, instead of the kind of practice that we see in uh, comprehensive programs, which is, I'm going to teach you, here we have, I'm going to do this with you. And it might be a pathway to support educators to build the skills as they go along, and I think could be a pathway to transforming both of those features of effective practice, the setting, so the interactions in the setting, and direct skill building. We'll find out. So we are now starting a trial, actually next week. So I fly from here to British Columbia with one day in between 
to begin this trial, and I will certainly let people know what happens. Um, so one feature of this work uh, in our kernel's work has really been about how do we support effective implementation as we go along. So we created a set of tools that teachers can use to reflect on the work. So it's an online set of questions, very simple to do. Teachers say, I'm from this school, I'm working with this grade, this is my role. And they answer the question, did I try the kernels? Which one? Did I do, uh, there's some subtleties in this I won't go into, but I can explain it later. Uh, and then how many times did you do it? How did they work? And what kinds of struggles are you facing in your classroom? On average, how are your students doing in these areas? And based on what teachers say here, we make recommendations for another set of kernels. So it's, it's a way to quickly provide some feedback to educators about the work that they're doing and give them something concrete to take away from it. So um, I'll just give you a flavor of this because I really only have two or three more minutes. Um, five or six. So I mentioned this challenge before. Uh, we've been working to try and build some coherence and connectivity to the field around the terminology. I do think that even within one setting, one school, let's say one school with 10 classrooms and 20 adults, each classroom looks very different from the next in this domain, and each adult carries with them a different view of these skills. So we've been thinking about how do we organize the terminology of the field so that those with different perspectives can more effectively communicate with each other. And so we're trying to adjust, address this challenge. And we've developed a website, it's called Explore SEL, and it's a way to connect the terminology in the frameworks that guide the field. I will be talking more about this for a full hour at three o'clock today. So uh, it looks like this, it's free online, that's the URL, and you can go on right now and look at all of these tools. Oh. Don't go on right now, okay. <laughs> Don't go on right now, but you could. Um, okay, last, last part. So we in our lab also have been thinking about how to contextualize and think about SEL more broadly. We do work in different countries, as you can see here, Lebanon, Niger, Sierra Leone, Brazil, Nigeria. We're starting a project now in Colombia. And there's a lot of interest in SEL around the world, tremendous amount of interest. And But there's a lot of... Uh, sort of simple adoption of, of Western US views on it. And uh, for the same reason that we struggle with implementation within the US across different communities, we will struggle with implementation across the globe because we want people to have their viewpoint represented and their work represented, their local needs to be part of the conversation. And so we've been doing work to think about how would you contextualize some of the work coming out of the US for other settings. And this is just an example of what we've done in Brazil. We've been working on this kernels project in creches in uh, doing these in different places in these two settings in Brazil. And uh, we started with a premise that we would draw upon the work we had already done, but that we would adapt it and co-construct the final product with educators and parents in Brazil, and we would create a set of tools so that local actors can customize the work for themselves. And th this is really a process of development, adaptation, field testing, and then revision that goes in a cycle. And we started by mapping uh, some of the, the sort of concepts of social emotional learning to the state system of standards for academic progress in order to show where we saw social and emotional skills and competencies in the standards that everybody was already working toward. And then we did focus groups with educators and parents to learn about local needs and redesign the kernels that we had already developed in service of those local needs. So from teachers, we learned about their concerns they were concerned about aggression and interpersonal violence, community violence, and the sort of sustainability of the earth and the environment. 
we decided based on what we learned with them to focus on how they, their skills and strategies in responding to emotional and behavioral challenges and then building their uh, students' self-regulation. So we built kernels that were about those two things. From parents, we learned that they were really concerned about maintaining and setting and having sort of rules and routines in the home, and they were also worried about exposure to interpersonal violence. They were particularly concerned about raising and growing citizens, those who cared about others in their environment. And so we decided for parents to focus on uh, strategies for them to build and maintain routines, and then kernels uh, that they worked on with their children um, that are really about building understanding of other. And these were work, we did this work with both parents and teachers and crossed between them. And then we developed these, a version of these cards that looked quite different because we got feedback from Brazilian educators and parents about how they should look and feel. And that was very important. The object we've learned over time is almost as important as the content has to feel like something that you can do and use. And that's often locally derived. We're just about to start a test of these. So now I'm at the end. <laughs> that was a lot of information. So uh, hopefully you'll walk away with all of it, but at least these three things. First, that social emotional skills and competencies are multifaceted. There are many important skills and competencies. They are deeply developmental, and they are situated in connective, connected, supportive relationships and settings. We cannot ever forget the setting. Approaches that are effective are targeted, and they, they do the work in ways that are relevant to a local setting. It has to be highly relevant to the work, to the priorities of a local setting, and they go between adults and children. And that, my view is that to push the field forward, to keep it vibrant, to make it really live up to its promise, we need new approaches. We need to think beyond the programs that we have. And we need these approaches to be more targeted, and more flexible, more portable, and more engaging. And that we have to operate with these uh, notions of contextualizing the work for a local setting, whether it's in the US or across countries. And that's all, thank you.